Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of JBF 2022. I'm Ashley with Halstead, and this session is called Finding Healthy Headspace as an Independent Jewelry Artist. And we have Lisa Lehman and Hillary Halstead Scott here to talk about this with you. Lisa is a goldsmith. Um, she owns Lisa Lehman Designs, and she works really hard to create this really great community around her customers on social media and everywhere. And Hillary is the president of Halstead, and she has a huge passion for helping small jewelry businesses grow and thrive. Um, so I will be moderating the session. I'll be in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for Lisa and Hillary, drop them in there, and I will ask them at the end during our Q&A time. If you have any technical difficulties, try refreshing the page, um, reloading it, leaving and coming back, and it should help you out. And just a reminder, it is being recorded, so if you miss it, we will be sending out the recording links next week. So I will turn it over to Lisa and Hillary so we can get started. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Please definitely Hello. tell us where you're from in the chat. We love seeing that. And while we're for getting sure. started, answer our little poll because we like kind of getting a, a feel for where the group is at. Mm -hmm. um, and I am joining you from Prescott, Arizona. But Lisa, where are you? I'm in Mexico, you know, Mexico. not where I'm from, but I just happen to be here on vacation. Ah, well, it's perfect because it's easy to find healthy headspace in Mexico, right? Amen. So I Amen. had to do this. I had to do this for the sake of the four. So good for you. I love it. I love it. And thank you for taking a minute out of your vacation to, to share all of this with us. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right. Let's jump in. Oh, I love seeing where everybody's from. It's so much fun. Me okay. too. It's so much fun. All right. So Ashley gave little intros, but I want to share a little bit more about my friend Lisa because Lisa and I go way back. <laughs> um, and we really wanted to share with all of you today because we've both been doing this for kind of a long time now. So about 20 years, we're experienced. Mm -hmm. That's what we say. Yes. Yes. Not <laughs> old. We're experienced. We are experienced. <laughs> <laughs> so Lisa is a talented and independent jewelry artist. She's been doing this for a very long time. I'm a small business owner. We know how tough this job can be. And um, we've both really kind of gotten through some ups and downs over the years. So we want to share our best tips and strategies for maintaining healthy headspace as a small business owner. Um, and the reason I invited Lisa to do this with me um, is because she's not only an amazing jewelry artist, but she is so good at this community part of marketing. So I really want you to check out Lisa's Instagram. Um, she was an early adopter of blogging and she nails this authenticity word that we hear so much about in marketing, right? So this is not about marketing, but Lisa shares with her community and lets them peek behind the curtain. And that means not just showing how jewelry is made, but she shows them that this um, glamorous, beautiful Cinderella life of a jewelry designer <laughs> is not always so charming and it has some real challenges. And Lisa is so honest about that. I think it really resonates with people and her clients. Um, she's written um, a guest blog for us on mental health in the past. Um, Ashley's gonna put that link up now. And she talks very openly about the stressors of the job. So we're gonna kind of get into all of that today. So let me share the results of this poll with everybody so you can see it. Yeah, I'm excited to see what the results are. All right, so I hope you guys can all see that now and see, oh yeah, this is tough stuff, right? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, we've all been there. We've yep. all been there at some point. And I think this is um, one of the dirty little secrets of entrepreneurship, right? Um, stress is a really big part of this of this job and this journey that we've all chosen, right, Lisa? Yeah, for sure. It takes a it takes a, a lot of hard work, yes, but the stress comes um, as part of the job description as well. It does, and you know, because of that, mental health issues are really common among small business owners, right? It is a reality of the job that we probably have a little higher stress rate than the average bear. Mm -hmm. So some of those things are listed here, right? And you know, maybe one or two of these words resonate with each of you. Um, and it can look very different. And 
you know, it can pop up, you know, very rarely, or it can pop up more frequently during tough times, right? So yeah. Lisa, what's, what's your experience with this? What are, what I are think, I think, it, I mean, you, knowing it and knowing that it's a possibility is, is huge, but knowing it's real and that acknowledging it is really one of the biggest steps. Like we need to acknowledge that it's there because that's probably one of our best self-defenses against it and being able to deal with it. Um, one of the techniques like we, you know, I've talked about a little bit and it's on the screen is the HALT acronym, you know, because when those things kind of pop up and you're feeling, is it burnout? Is it anxiety? Am I depressed? It's like, it, or, am I hungry? Am I anxious? Am I lonely? Or am I tired? You know, those are things that sometimes will, I mean, for me, I have to look at like, what is it? What is really getting at me? So that's like a skimming the surface, but knowing that the, those are things that pop up, but just trying to find where the core is that where they're coming from is super important. Right. I think that's a great thought. I mean, sometimes it's an immediate need, just you didn't get enough sleep last night. You were trying to make a design, exactly. you're just tired. <laughs> so if you have all of this negativity making you crazy, that's a good self check. Um, I do want to call out loneliness though, because I think in our field, it's a little bit of a distinct issue um, compared to, you know, people who go to an office and have a lot of colleagues sure. at work. Um, I think loneliness can be a more serious issue for jewelry artists because so many people in our field do work, um, you know, from home and often alone. And the loneliness can become more of a serious challenge than um, just a little bit of a self check. Um, so that's something to be aware of too in our profession, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, we often work by ourselves and often in smaller spaces too. And all of that combined can can make us feel pretty lonely at times. Absolutely. All right. So today, if you walk away from this. With these three takeaways, Lisa and I are going to feel pretty good about ourselves. <laughs> so first and foremost, um, you're among your people here. And JBF is all about finding community, even remotely. I hope you're all connecting in the chat and following each other on Instagram, making yes. some new friends. Um, you are among people that get it. Um, we really want you to understand that stress is a normal part of being a jewelry artist and a small business owner. So you're not the only one. You're not doing it wrong if you feel stressed it's normal. Um, so we want to talk about strategizing about that, right? So you need a, you need a marketing strategy, you need a cash flow strategy, but you also need a healthy headspace strategy. If you're going to prosper and thrive, um, in this profession, you're going to have to have a game plan for recognizing red flags and addressing them as best you can, um, to make sure that you can, can do this job in the long term. Mm -hmm. All right. So the first thing we want to do is just kind of recognize some of the real challenges of being an independent jewelry artist up front. We're going to touch on these kind of quickly, and then we're going to get to the, the action steps, right? So this is the big one. <laughs> this is the big one. All right, Lisa, what do you think? Well, I mean, with jewelry, it's very seasonal. Um, obviously, you all know as jewelry artists, you know, we could be going crazy in, at the holiday time and then get to this month which is notoriously slow and it's hard. And um, one of the things I've learned, and it's taken me 20 years in business to figure this out, is really it's super important to have a budget. Um, and it, that doesn't have to be a crazy, you know, like detailed whatever, but have a budget. So you're putting money aside, putting money aside for your tax savings, putting money aside for, you know, just other savings so that you know when these times come, you have something to fall back on, especially, you know, with tax income, that's huge for me. And um, monetary spending. I mean, it's easy to buy all the shiny things that Halstead has, <laughs> but, you know, monetary spending, I set myself a weekly budget of what I will spend. And of course, I, that's flexible depending on, um, you know, seasonal things, but it's really important to plan ahead. So you don't have the stress of the those low times. I just find that as a personally has been a really big one for me. Yeah, absolutely. And that resonates so well with Mariel Diaz's presentation this morning. She talked a lot about saving and having a budget. Um, as a small business owner, you don't get a steady paycheck a lot of times, right? So um, this is a skill, you know, to tackle early if you're just getting started and kind of develop those healthy habits of budgeting and planning and saving. Um, and just kind of recognizing that seasonality is going to happen. You know, every January I freak out and keep checking the website. <laughs> like, is something Same. broken? 
<laughs> Same. I've been doing this for 20 years, but nobody I wants my stuff. I know oh, every I time, every nervous. January. Right? Especially after the holidays. It's been so busy. You've been going full throttle for months on end, and all of a sudden it just stops. And it's scary. And that leads to a different kind of stress, right? Because you're probably still recovering from the frantic pace of the holidays. Um, so again, this is a good time to lean on your community and just kind of talk to people in jewelry. It's slow. Yes, it's slow. It's not just you. It's not just you. <laughs> it's not just not you. Just all right. And this is getting a lot of media attention these days, but I think in our profession, it's especially, it's especially poignant, right? We see these um, jewelry superstars on Instagram and we get stuck kind of thinking this overnight success is really easy and everybody else is nailing it. And they have all these followers and celebrities buying their work and what am I doing wrong? Right? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is comparison is the thief of joy, right? And, and we've all heard that quote, but really social media is the thief of joy. Um, it's so easy to get caught up in, in that whole mentality. And honestly, you know, likes do not equate to success. Um, you know, more followers does not equate to success. I think the biggest thing, and you do have to make a conscious choice of this every single day, is stay in your lane your people are your people and you will reach them and you will make a difference to the one to the two it, it, it's not about the masses but it is hard when you see what you presume as success or somebody's you know b-roll actually or you know a-roll b-roll where they look like everything is fantastic but um you know don't don't let don't allow yourself to get sucked into that because that will just take all of your joy away and the whole thing it will. And I think it's really important to lean into our jewelry community. Um, you know, mm -hmm. this peer group, and I love seeing you all connect in the sidebar. Um, but it can also be a little bit of a trap, right? And so there's a lot of talk about getting stuck in the jewelry bubble, where if you're on social media and you're following all these other jewelers, then this is going to be more of an issue, this self-comparison trap. And I think Lisa is really smart there. Like, know what you're there for. You know, go in um, with your your intentions to either market or maybe sometimes you do go in to look at other jewelers, but go into that with, you know, a goal in mind when you're spending time there and don't just get stuck in this scrolling trap yeah. where you can really start doubting yourself. Right. All right. Another reality of the jewelry artist's life is that people can say some pretty insensitive things, right? At trade shows, online. Um, your work is an extension of you. And so when we hear these nasty little comments about your business, your passion, your love, it is super painful. It is. And it can be, it can be devastating. You know, you could have a thousand people who love what you do and you can get the one person who comes and slides in there and, and says the nasty thing or criticizes your work or, you know, my sister can do that too. Or, you know, and it's, I, we like Hillary and I said, we don't want to stand here too long, but know that that is real and let it go walk away because they're out there and, and their meanness will continue for all time, but don't let it impact you. You are yeah. doing great things. You are doing great things and not everybody's going to like your work. And I think um, we all need to get comfortable saying that, you know, mm -hmm. your jewelry is not for everybody. My business is not for everybody. It's for a certain audience. And if um, someone isn't the right audience, okay you know, move on, okay. Walk on. <laughs> move on and exactly. let it go. And, and exactly. that's exactly it. it does. It's, it's still hard to, to let those things go. But here's a little wisdom from Lisa. <laughs> I love this quote. <laughs> I do too. I have a love affair with guacamole. Talk, talk about the yeah. trolls. When I posted this quote on my Instagram, I got probably the, one of the, biggest blow up posts I ever posted, right? And you know, everybody loved it, except for the one person who said, well, that's dumb. I don't even like avocados. <laughs> like, I love that they trolled your anti -troll Okay, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. You know, just talking about trolls. Like, did you have to say it? Whatever, yeah. but um, I think, <laughs> I think like we said in the last slide, like not everybody's gonna like you. You find your avocado tribe. You find those people and you do your work for for you for them and that community is going to end up being the people who come through for you in the lean times in the best times like that community of your buyers your tribe your customers that's important you need to foster that and not worry about all the other people who don't like your work at this time or just don't you know it's just not their thing that's okay that's okay yeah 
it's There's okay right <laughs> exactly okay and as artists and small business owners I think we're a very self-critical crowd. I think that kind of comes with the territory. And when you're running your own show and you're the boss lady or the boss man, or um, you just are always kind of feeling this sense of all the things you're not getting done, <laughs> right? Um, and it feels right. like drowning or being crushed, right? We hear these words a lot. Yeah, it feels, I mean, often it just feels like this huge weight and we all go through those periods where, you know, am I good enough? Is anybody ever going to like this? Am I going to be able to sell this? Can I make a living at this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you just have to continue to work at your craft and know and believe in what you do and not let those little voices that come in there and tell you those things. But um, even, even for me, like I will make a mistake at the bench and do something that I've done a thousand times and immediately I'm like, oh, done i'm over i can't i'm t i'm terrible at making jewelry um and that self-doubt can just perpetuate if you especially if you're in it, one of those stressful times so just being very aware and uh finding tools to help us swim instead of sink in these times yeah absolutely and again just kind of knowing this is a common experience among other jewelers and small business owners i think is really important because it helps you to kind of do that mental check and just say you know this happens it's a bad day Yes. All right. So now that we got all of that ugly stuff out of the way, I just want to make sure you all know you're among your tribe. These are people that understand all of these things. So, you know, a lot of your friends, when you um, are having a rough day, they may not really get it if they get a regular paycheck, if they're not involved in creative work, um, if they're not, um, you know, the engine behind <laughs> the success or failure of the business they work for, you know, you face unique pressures and it, it takes a lot of courage to do what you're doing. Um, so kudos to you. I mean, you do need to pat yourself on the back for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. And, you know, we choose to do this. We, we choose this and, and stepping into that choice, like all things, it's going to come with some of those hardships. And, and really right now, the jewelry community is so awesome. I mean, just seeing all of you here and connecting, like we're here for each other. And even if you are the introvert who doesn't like to do, you know, connecting and social, this is a great place to find that community that can help you through those times to help you build a roadmap and, and to lean on in those stressors. Absolutely. And I think this one mindset piece of remembering it's a choice is a really important tool. And it's something I circle back to over and over again um, during the tough times or tougher years in business. Um, and I think it's a really good exercise sometimes to just think through, okay, if I chose not to run my own business anymore, what would I do instead? You do have options. I mean, you can, you can relocate, you can rejoin the workforce in another way. Um, it is a choice to stay and continue operating your business. And that usually allows me to just kind of move past that um, point where I'm feeling stuck and say, yeah, I do want to do this. It is worth it. I've gotten through tough stuff before and I'm going to get through this too. So I'm going to choose to move forward. Um, so that one word of choice and kind of um, empowering yourself um, with yes. that mindset is a really useful tool um, as you move through, you know, the, the tougher times and the leaner times in, in leadership. For sure. I mean, just choosing. I mean, the fact that you chose it means that there's a passion there and you have to dig deep into what that passion was. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's huge. It's a gift. You're also it's talented. A good it's a huge gift. It's a good anchor. All right. It so we talked about the challenges. Now let's talk about what you can do about it. So mm -hmm. for those of you who want to dig a little deeper, Ashley's going to drop a link over in the chat. Um, for a worksheet we have, you can you can do it now, but you can also do it later um, just to get some things written on paper. Um, otherwise, if you have a notebook or a journal, I really encourage you to write some things down um, because again, just like your marketing strategy, I think as a small business owner and an artist, you need a healthy headspace strategy. So get some of these thoughts in writing that can be so helpful over time. And Lisa, I know I love your bird. Sorry about the bird. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> uh, Lisa, you're an amazing journaler. And sometimes you post these gorgeous pictures of your journals and they're so beautiful. Oh, thank you. I mean, writing is huge for me, keeping track of things, painting, writing, you know, yeah. I like to do that. Yeah. So jot down some, jot down some keywords, just things that resonate with you yes. as we're moving through this. 
So the first thing we want to talk about is setting boundaries. And this is a mm. really big part of mental health um, in what we do. So we're going to move yeah. through like each of these and touch on them briefly. You can get a little more in depth with the worksheet. Um, but you do need to set some guardrails on your life because as a small business owner, um, your boundaries get really blurred in what's um, work time and personal time and, and space and all of these different things just tend to merge together. And over and over again, I have to kind of circle back to reestablishing those separation points in my life in order to stay sane. <laughs> yeah, I think boundaries for me has been one of the keys to, you know, having a business that flows in a regular sort of, um, you know, system. I think, you know, especially you know, workspace. I have, I have worked from home. I have worked from other places. I have, I have worked, you know, in other people's studios, but having a very clear cut workspace for me has been a, a huge boundary. Um, so I know that I go to work and I have a defined space and my, my studio is really my happy place. I'm, it's, decorated and designed way different than anything I would do. And it's just, I know when I'm there, I'm in, I'm at work. And I think having that boundary, even if it's a small corner of your kitchen, having that space be very defined that that's where you work. I think that makes a huge difference right there. I mean, that's a good start for things. That's a good start. And sometimes it's even small, like physical markers in your day. So I have these little prompts because I definitely want you guys sharing your experiences in the chat with one of the, another. I think that brings a lot of value to these sessions. Um, mm -hmm. But small markers in your day to signify that it's it's work time and workplace. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of friends of mine and especially through the pandemic, we've all been talking about this. Like, do you work in your pajamas? Do you brush your teeth before you start working? <laughs> what is your signal that I am exiting home time and starting my work time? Um, and those habits and routines, um, they're really helpful. Um, and even on a subconscious level, they just kind of help you switch gears and separate out, you know, maybe your, your personal and home life worries and, and focal points away from the things you need to be focused on for your work, right? Yeah, I think when I started my business and I had my kids were small and I was still homeschooling and I was trying to do this, it was impossible in the beginning. And at that time with small kids, I made Excel sheets, spreadsheets, and that's how I went through my day. And it was, you know, we teach, I was teaching this, this and this, and then this is mom's studio time. And, it, you know, we stuck to that routine and that really helped me not just kind of be like, oh, I'm going to go do laundry or what, because it's easy, it's so easy to get distracted when yeah. you have a studio at home, especially. And kids. I know. I see a lot of comments. And um, kids. kids. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and pets. I, and did, all I did this before. I had, <laughs> I had four small people and I homeschooled and I built the business. So it is possible. <laughs> you will survive it. <laughs> you will. <laughs> exactly. So boundaries matter not just in your physical space and um, getting yourself ready for the day, but in your time, right? And during busy season, we all just got through Christmas. You know, your work days get longer and longer. They creep under your weekends. Um, but I think establishing some sort of written schedule for yourself that these are my work hours and these are not my work hours. Um, even if you have to kind of come back and remind yourself when it starts to creep away from you, um, having your work hours posted for yourself <laughs> even if it's not for your customers, I think is a really important tool as a business owner. Yeah, I mean, I have a very pretty regular routine of how I start my day and go to work. And, but I also have to be pretty strict about you know, time, you know, and we'll talk about this too with social media and how much time I'm going to spend there. And then when I am done working, I'm done working. You know, mm -hmm. I try not to take work into my evenings where, you know, especially when my kids were small and sit there and, and work while they were there. It's just, it, it not only helps the people around you know you're present, but it helps you really define who you are and what you're doing and what you're building. And it makes a big difference. Yeah. You need to really take does. some breaks. Go to, yeah. <laughs> Go to Mexico. I know. I love that we're saying you're going to intrude on your vacation. <laughs> do as we say, so, not as we do. <laughs> right. Exactly. It was it was part of the plan before it was fine. <laughs> all right. And this one, right? Mm. We all know this on a rational level. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> but we do. I mean, we all I get those. I don't know if you have the iPhone, you get the alert at the beginning of your week and saying you've spent this much time on your phone. 
I just think one of the beauties of social media is the exposure we get with it. One of the detriments of it is the time it can suck us away from what we're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, for me personally, I set really specific time limits of what I'll do. I also, when I'm in the studio, my phone is on silent. Mm -hmm. And the only alerts that come through are my kids because they have special text alerts. Um, otherwise, I don't, you don't have to respond to everything that comes through. I mean, just while I'm sitting here, I've watched two Etsy combos come through and I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm on vacation. <laughs> but you don't have to respond. You get to make rules about when you will respond and how you will respond and what that looks like for you. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we could just get sucked into the cell phone. Yeah, for sure. And there are some good tools. So, you know, in the chat, I see you all talking about Trello. That's great. Um, there are some other mm -hmm. really helpful cell phone tools. But before we move on to those, I do want to talk about notifications and alerts because those things are totally in your control. And that's something I had to really, um, I had to do years ago. Um, and every time I get a new cell phone, um, it's a reminder to me of how um, difficult it is when you don't remove all of those alerts and pop-ups and audible sounds from your cell phone. Um, the first you know, week or two after I get one, I'm always just kind of putting that off and it's just chirping and chiming and popping and bright lights all over the place all the time. You can't, I can't focus at all. Um, so those are things that you can suppress and then go in and set a time for checking your email and checking your orders and going on social media. So you're in control of it again. Um, mm -hmm. Lisa, tell me about some of the positive apps you've used for, you know, kind of time management and some of these headspace things that we're talking about. There's good stuff too. Yeah. I'd love to know what's out there, what people have tried. Yeah. I've used it for me. I mean, I love to use the calm app and the, is it Numa is my new sleep favorite sleep app, but there's a lot of, good ways of things to uh, wind down and step away from the work we're supposed to work step away from the work so we can do what we're supposed to be doing and relax in right. our downtime too. That's right. And um, I love the Headspace app. I use that for meditation sometimes mm -hmm. when I need it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have this um, app I use when I find myself checking myself in too much. And I was telling Lisa about this. It's called Dating. <laughs> said... And um, you set That's a timer on it and it kind of locks you out of all of your apps. Um, and it has a little animated tree that like grows as your timer progresses. And if you close the app to check your other things, the little tree dies. <laughs> She's a tree killer. It's, a step. it's really hilarious. Really I think it's crazy. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's kind of funny, but it also truly works and like trains me again to like put down the cell phone, walk away from it put it in a drawer <laughs> um, because you have to find you, what works for you. Yeah, you, you check it more and more and you find that like time interval keeps shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Um, and so that app helps me kind of get back in charge of it again when I need it. So I just keep it on my phone. I know it's there. If I, if I've been bad, I'll queue it up again. <laughs> so much. <laughs> All right. Um, and this is a big one when you run your own show, the, the personal and professional boundaries. And I think this is especially difficult to navigate when you're first starting a business. And especially because jewelry so often evolves from a hobby that is very much a part of your, your personal life. And then it becomes, you know, your professional life. And that transition can be really rocky. Um, so we all have to find our own comfort zone with this. So Lisa, talk about mm -hmm. your personal and professional boundaries. What works for you? I mean, this has been huge for me, mostly because like you said in the beginning, I've been blogging since they invented blogs. Okay. I'm not that old, but, um, <laughs> you know, and sharing a lot. And when I started my A business, I really consciously made the choice that I wanted to make it more of a journey, um, of my life through it. You know, my blog is called journey of a jeweler and that's what it's been for decades. Um, but you have to be real careful and you get to decide what you will or will not share. You don't have to share your family life or, you know, your outside of the studio life. That's okay. But if you do choose to share, then you need to figure out again, what are those boundaries? Um, you know, how, how much will I share and when will I share? You know, another thing to process in that is, you know, like that same halt technique. If I'm in those stressor moments and looking, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, um, is that the best time for me to be 
sharing on my business page or my Instagram account or whatever. So thinking those things through. And one of the big ones for those of you that have small kids, um, know that someday they will not be small kids. And um, mine have definite opinions about what I did or did not share or wanted some photos that are so embarrassing taken down from things. So, I mean, those are things just to consider because you're not, when you do choose to share more of your personal life, you are sharing other people's lives as part of that as well, if that makes sense. So just yeah. something to be mindful of. And I think there's a lot of pressure on artists, especially um, to blur these boundaries and share all of your personal life and all of your personal information. And you don't have to do that. That is a choice. You do not have to. Um, you can definitely set your own limits, kind of jot down what you are comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. Um, for me, um, navigating this very early, I had a really hard time um, when I was using the same social media apps for my personal life and my professional life. So I've created really clear divisions. Like I, um, you know, Facebook was first, right? So I actually have a totally separate Facebook account for my personal friends and family um, compared to my my work life, my work persona, totally separate. So if I'm scrolling through in my work day, I'm not seeing my cousins and my friends and the weekend um, and vice versa. When I want to get in there and connect with my family and just unwind, I'm not seeing all this work stuff that's making me think about things I have to get done. Um, and so I've kind of created those clear divisions. For me, Instagram is work. LinkedIn is work. Um, Facebook, I have one of each, you know. So again, those boundaries, just to allow me that mm -hmm. separation, um, that's really worked for me. And, you know, each of us is different. So you just got to kind of make your game plan and, and stick to it. Exactly. And you can change it at any time. You know, again, it's back yeah. to that choice. You're not stuck in it, but, you know, just think it through. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we've, we've kind of let go of this notion that we can prevent stress because you can't. <laughs> stress is going to happen. Just accept it. <laughs> so what we need to do is strategize about how to recognize it and how to deal with it in really healthy ways um, so it doesn't get the better of us, right? So we're going to go yeah. through each of these things um, and talk about them a little bit more. And I love this post so much. This is the best picture. No. <laughs> and it was really that post was from a really stressful time yeah. um, in my in my life with my kids and things were going on. And I thought, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> and so um, for me, you know, you, you red flags like, OK, if I feel like I'm losing my mind, probably am. Um, but for me, I struggle with depression. So if I feel that coming up, like then I know that that's something I really need to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, other <laughs> red flags for me, I will start organizing everything in my house. <laughs> I will find anything and everything to clean and organize instead of go to the studio. Um, I read a book some time ago, maybe some of you have read it, The War of Art. He talks about where anything and everything will get in the way of us doing our art. And that is so true. And those, But those are usually times when I'm feeling that kind of stress or that burnout or or whatever and you know where I'm not quite myself so if I'm avoiding work I'm generally not feeling so great if I'm finding myself drinking that one two three ten glasses of wine okay, no, that's <laughs> there's you know, then I also know that that's those are signs that something is something is there's askew there's in my mental state yeah so if you're comfortable tell us in the chat things you know about yourself I think you know, we usually know these things about ourselves, but we don't always want to admit them. Um, I think it, yes. it's really helpful to have a partner or a friend in your life who can kind of cue you on these things. My husband will definitely say to me, when did you go for a hike last? You need to get outside. <laughs> go play outside right now. <laughs> um, go play because, outside. You know, we want to deny it. We want to say we're okay and, oh, it's fine. I'm fine. Um, but sometimes you're not. And so, um, you know, for me, I know if I'm not sleeping well, um, you know, the more nights I have of bad sleep, I definitely know it's building up on me. Um, if I am just getting home from work and wanting to like sit down in front of the TV, that is a red flag for me because that's not something I do a lot of ordinarily, um, but it's what I do and I'm really fried. Um, so, you know, these are things it does help to write down in your journal or something and just say, these are my signs. I need to, I need to recognize these and be honest with myself about them um, and make a deal with myself. Like if, if I'm noticing this two, three times in a week, 
um, then I need to, to make a change, take an action. Yeah, game plan, game plan. So then what do you do? What do you do when you've like triggered your red flags? One of the biggest things for me that I have found is if, if it's just that I'm in avoidance or, you know, I think someone in the chat said they tend to watch other jewelry making videos. Same, because, you know, it's way more fun to watch somebody else make jewelry than yourself. Um, but one of the things I have found is for me, I need to do something creative that is not jewelry. Um, you know, I have the luxury, I love to draw, I love to paint. Um, so I will do that. And if I tend to put my creativity into something else, then it, my mojo tends to come back on the other side of it. So that's just, I mean, that's something not when I'm like seriously, you know, stressed out, but that's just something that really helps me get my mojo back. But, you know, also, you know, I don't have the luxury of hiking in Arizona, but I do like to get outside, take my dogs for a walk, get some mm -hmm. exercise. And a lot of times I just need to get some sleep. Yeah. Sleep is, sleep is big, right? Yeah. Um, and sleep I sleep is bigger than, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to get outside, you know, if it's hiking, if it's running, if it's digging in the garden and um, planting things and picking things, um, that's um, definitely um, therapeutic for me. And just being out among the living things in the green um, makes a huge difference in my week. Um, so I really try and make sure my weekends are full of as much of that as possible to recharge. Um, and when I'm starting to feel the strain of work, I, I know I need to make space for those things um, and prioritize them. more. Um, and again, this is a strategy. It's, it's as important as the money in your business, um, because if you can't mentally be in the game for your business, there, there often isn't someone to fall back on in our position, right? So you have to be able to check yourself and reset and hit those buttons to get back to where you need to be to perform. Um, so take mm -hmm. this stuff seriously. It's not extra. It's not fluff. Um, you know, we hear a lot about self-care these days, and I think sometimes it sounds a little indulgent, um, but at a certain level, it, it, it is really necessary to functioning. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, it doesn't mean you just go weeks on end without working, but do what's realistic so that you can kind of balance out um, your work and your personal life and, and get to a healthy space again, right? For sure, for sure. Go to Mexico. Go to Mexico. <laughs> That's gonna be my answer for everything today. Uh, so I wanna talk about this word resilient as part of a stress management strategy because I feel like this is an annoying word that gets thrown around a lot. Um, you just need to be resilient to just do that, right? Um, but what does that really mean? Um, and uh, Lisa, you you talk a lot about being resilient. So what does that word mean to you? I mean, I think in all of these things, wherever you are falling in your state of mind, you know, whatever it is, you resilient, part of being resilient for me is acknowledging where I am. Like we've talked about really calling it out. Yeah, I'm stressed out. Yeah, I'm feeling depressed. Yeah, I'm feeling, you know, just like I'm, I'm a loser at this, you know, those head voices that come through. But then after calling it out, actually moving on, like just sometimes you just have to put one foot in front of the other yeah. and do the next thing, you know, and just cho choosing to that. And to me, that's resilience. You know, when you, when you look at the things that are thrown at us and we are going to get tons of things thrown at us all the time, it's choosing the next thing, how we're going to respond to that, um, to others, to ourselves, to the people around us and, and how we're going to continue moving forward because, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise we're just going to hit the wall and that doesn't do anything for us. But if we can find ways to step over that wall, it may not be pretty, but it's important. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's resilience. Yeah, and I think it's important to emphasize that resilient is a resiliency is a learned skill. Um, you know, it's not something you're born with or not. It's something you practice and you get better at. And this is a place where experience really does help. Um, and some of you who are mid-career and late-career artists, maybe you can chime in on this too. Um, but it's kind of like that thick skin. You know, the the more times you fail in small or big ways and pick yourself back up again and realize that you got through it, um, the more clarity you have on kind of facing those challenges, confronting them and realizing you're gonna get through them. And I think that's resiliency. So even if you may, you know, crumble in the moment 
and have some bad days or weeks, which is okay. It's okay. You know, hit these, Mm -hmm. these reset buttons that we're talking about, but then remind yourself, okay. Um, yeah, I've hit, I've hit hard stuff before I have made mistakes before and a lot of them and you survive it, you learn from it and you, and you get through it. And I do think, you know, that whole, whatever doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Again, it's that thing we hear all the time, but there's so much, there's so much truth to it in small business. So much true. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, when I, when I think about over the 20 years of business, the things that have come into play where I thought this is it, I'm done, but you know, you just, you learn from them and come back in different ways. That's right. That's right. Um, And I think something that's really important um, when you run your own business is building community and networking um, and really leaning into other business owners during your tough times, because they are going to understand some of these things we're talking about better than a lot of your other friends might. Um, So, you know, you're connecting with each other here. This is fantastic. Conferences like this. Um, but there are a lot of ways to network and find other business owners. Um, so Lisa, tell us about, you know, how you've, you've met this community need in your life. Um, you know, because again, when I started the business, my kids were small and I, I was stay at home mom working from home had, was homeschooling. I didn't have people. Um, and at the time, the jewelry community was not what it is now. And now I have found like, it's just such a beautiful place to meet other people or I've joined masterminds and some of my best jewelry friends have come from my mastermind group. And that was from years ago um, with Flourish and Thrive. And I just adore these women and they're my people that I can go to. And I, you know, stay in touch with things like this, these forums, this is great. The stuff that Halstead puts out is amazing. And then, you know, there are different retreats and jewelry making things and even just a yoga retreat or just finding other people that you can connect with and uh and that understand who you are what you do whether it's your exact craft or just somebody else who's a small business owner um and you know like taking time for just being with friends i can always find an excuse to work i can always say no i've got work to do but sometimes we just need to walk away from the work and have that social time with friends yeah absolutely and other business owners um, have been the people I really lean on during during the toughest times mm-hmm. in my career. Um, those are the people I go to and and really honestly have discussions about what I'm struggling with um, and how do you get through it and what do you do next to kind of put one foot in front of the other. Those other business owners really get it and they have very practical advice. Um, you know, when you when you talk to other people in your social circle about it, um, you know, you get the the sympathy and oh you'll be okay and that kind of thing, but um, they don't have the, the practical step-by-step um, advice to share that other business owners really do. Um, so sure. really work to make those networking connections um, wherever you can, and they will carry you through. Mm-hmm. All right, this is the mom slide. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> but we're going to talk about this for a minute because <laughs> you need to hear it. <laughs> and I know it's annoying. And in conferences like this, you get this a lot, right? It goes onto the list of things you feel like you're not doing well. <laughs> all the planning and organizing. Um, I'd love to say you could skip all this, but it really does help. Um, and when I'm feeling- Even if you frazzled, pull a couple of these pieces out of here, you'll you'll have a win. When I'm the most frazzled, if I can come back and do a little organizing day, I feel so much better. I'm feeling control again, right? And Lisa, um, one thing I really want you to talk about on this, this slide in particular is batch working, because I know how critical that's been for you. In your time yeah i think that's that's really helped me because you know as anyone who makes jewelry you know you can get caught up in what you're doing and and just lost in you know a certain thing now i tend to work uh, on 10 different projects at once but i work well like that but i do set myself time limits um you know especially in the morning because i always start out at my desk so i will say okay i've got from now till now and that's desk time and when it's done it's done. And then I walk in and I go to the next piece and part, you know, I'm going to work on this project or I'm going to set stones now for two hours or, or whatever it is. But I think that's really helped me stay on task and stay super focused to get more done. 
Um, you know, I'm not so great at the planning tools, but I'm very good at batch, batch working. <laughs> <laughs> well, and knowing that again, like having a strategy, having something that you've jotted down in your notes is like your fallback fallback plan, right? Like I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need to spend a few days sticking to this schedule to get back on my game, you know? Um, exactly. Plan. And, you know, cause when you're most stressed, you're least able to problem solve. So it helps to have oh things written down yeah. somewhere to just kind of remind yourself so you can just fall back on them, not have to think too hard about it, but you know, it's going to, it's going to help. Well, sometimes you, we need somebody to tell us what to do because, yes. you know, we don't have a boss, you know, so you, by setting those things in place, you got a boss. Yeah. Boss yourself when you're, when you're most fresh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, creativity doesn't always flow as freely as we would like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this can be a real stressor too. And it can even lead to these feelings of panic, you know, when you feel like you can't design, you can't create work. You said earlier, I feel like I'm a terrible jeweler. I just haven't made anything good in a while. I'm making mistakes. Um, so having some exercises that you use to reignite that creativity um, is something that's important to have as part of your strategy too. Um, so Lisa, what do you do when you feel stuck? Well, I talked about it before is painting is a big one for me. And actually, um, when I was having a really tough time back in, I think it was even November, I was really trying to having a hard time getting in things. I, I cut out little squares and I would paint three little squares every morning before I hit the studio. And it didn't matter what I painted and they were trash, but I would get out the paint, get out the brushes and just get my mind doing something else. And then I could go to the studio. So that, I mean, that's a big one for me yeah. in order to um, really kind of fire up the creativity. That's awesome. And just a little color too. It's so helpful. Yes. Because metal can sometimes be boring. We don't always get the pretty stones, you know. <laughs> yeah. It can be very monochromatic sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yes. All right. I think setting expectations for both yourself and for, you know, the other relationships in your network is a really critical skill when we talk about um, stress management strategies. Um, again, early career, I think it's very easy to get in this trap of like, if you don't respond immediately, you're going to lose a sale. If you don't turn around and ship out a custom piece in just a few days, they're going to be dissatisfied. So we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to kind of overperform on some of these things. And sometimes the best strategy is just to kind of look at what's realistic for you. What is a deadline you can consistently meet in turnaround times for some of these routine tasks in your business? And then disclose them up front on your website, in your email signature. You know, I respond to emails within, you know, one to three business days or whatever it is for you. Um, and then, you know, whoever gets that autoresponder back, they know exactly what to expect. Uh, it just provides clarity for everybody. So Lisa, give us a few rules of thumb that you use in terms of setting expectations for responses with um, you know, clients and vendors and everybody else. Well, for, for one, I do email in the morning and I do email in late afternoon or evening. And that's it. If you send me an email during the day, I'm not going to respond. Um, this week, I may respond to an email if I see something important, but probably not because um, I'm away. And that's, you know, and I don't feel pressured, you know, to to do that and to be run by that. I, if you send me a message on um, a direct message on Instagram or Facebook messenger, oh Lord, please never do that. And ask me about a project. I will direct you to email because I will never remember that you sent me something there. And those are just rules. And my website is very clear about my timeframes and what to expect and how it will work. And, and so those boundaries are already set in place. And I think the biggest thing we have to pay attention to is use the word no. Know your, not only know your limits on time, know your limits on your mental capacity. What, what are you really, you know, can you do? And um, know what you can do with ability. Sometimes some things are beyond what your skill level is. And it's okay because there's someone else who can do something. So I just think really um, setting expectations for yourself We'll set expectations for your customers and we'll alleviate a lot of stress of people saying, you know, because we're not Amazon. No. no. Or just not. <laughs> no, we are not available 24-7 and that is okay. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. Very okay. Very okay. All right. And I also want to talk about building your team because even if you have zero employees, you need a team if you're an entrepreneur. Um, and I think it's just, again, a mindset 
a mindset shift. You know, we talked earlier about business ownership as a choice, kind of really dig into that, but also dig into building a team around you. Um, and this can be your accountant, you know, your um, social media outsourced company. Um, it can be some of your, your peers you learn jewelry making with. Um, but you need a support network that kind of um, props up your business in big and small ways. So Lisa, tell us about a few key members on your larger team to, to keep this whole show running. Um, well, I've had studio assistants, which I have loved. Currently, I do not. Um, and, you know, so that's where I am. But I have somebody who helps me with marketing. I have an accountant. I have someone who helps me with that budget I mentioned. Um, you know, I'd really like somebody to do my house cleaning, but that's on the list because that would help me more. But it's just things, anything that enables you more time to do what you're best at is your is money well spent because we, sh you know, for years I always thought I could do it all. I just cannot. <laughs> Right. And I think it's also a good mental check in those times when you do feel that sense of drowning and being crushed is remember that you're not alone. You do have these other, you know, kind of support people and functions around your business. Um, and sometimes you may need them more than others. And sometimes you may need to reach out and say, I need some extra help for the next few months. Um, and so getting those relationships in your network can really help carry you through. Yeah, for sure. For sure. This photo cracks me up. I love this photo. <laughs> I'm <laughs> super happy. Photo. You got a ribbon. Yes. I did get a ribbon. I'm so proud. <laughs> you should be. All right. So what was it? What was the but, ribbon? Uh, it was uh, an honorable mention in a local uh, contest for a piece of jewelry. So I was just really excited to be acknowledged and I am really big on celebrating wins and I think that's important for us to do, whether it is getting your ribbon or, you know, or just having that sale in one sale a week or one sale a day or whatever your goals are, just really kicking in and celebrating that. Like that's, that's huge as a solopreneur. It's huge. And again, like write this down. This is a big deal. Like this isn't optional um, because I think, mm -hmm. When you are your own boss, you miss out on so much positive feedback. Um, usually when you're the boss, you get all the negative feedback. You don't get a lot of positive feedback. So um, you really have to, to recognize progress. Um, and when you are, you know, achieving milestones or, or growing in some way, right? So establish some little traditions for yourself. Um, or some like incremental milestones, nothing big. You don't have to clear these huge numbers. Um, but the first time you get a custom order, the first time you get a certain number of orders in a week, um, when you hit one of those numbers that you've been looking forward to, you do need to celebrate it um, because you're not getting performance reviews. You're not getting those high fives at work and colleagues saying, oh, you did such a good job on this project. You know, you you don't get that positive feedback loop in your career as much when you work for yourself. Um, so kind of set goals, um, establish these little things. I know one studio that rings a bell every time they get a custom order contract. I love that. I love That's that. So cute. Those are really fun little things. And it helps you recognize this stuff because otherwise it gets lost in the daily grind. It does. Find the joy in your day for the things you do. Whether I mean, even if it's setting a stone, you did it right the first time. <laughs> I'm a big yes. celebrator. Turn on your favorite song and do a little dance. That stuff matters. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, so we definitely talked about ways to have a strategy. Strategy. I can't even talk now. A strategy. Easy for you to say. Right? <laughs> um, try and, you know, keep stress in check, but sometimes it's too much and that's okay. Um, so obviously Lisa and I are not counselors or licensed therapists, and sometimes you do need more help. Um, and I have definitely seen a counselor a few times over my long career, um, during the toughest times in my business. And it has really helped me get perspective and get through. Um, so this is something that can be part of your team. Um, having a counselor can look different for everybody. You know, some people see a counselor on a really regular basis. Some people just see them sporadically as needed over time. So um, it's it's something that's good to kind of research and have in your back pocket if you do need it at some point. Um, and these are some just tips on getting the most out of, um, you know, recognizing when you may need some more extra help um, and finding a good fit for you. 
Mm-hmm. And mental health is just, I mean, like Hillary said, I wrote a blog on it for them and I have blogged about it, my struggle with depression for so long. And mostly because I always felt like I had a voice so that I wanted to make it th- that you don't feel alone because it is so normal. And we just sometimes don't talk about it enough and we don't get the help that we need. I mean, for me, my therapist has really just, you know, changed my life and drugs to help me through each day changed my life. And that's okay. That's what I need. And, you know, like Hillary said, it may be seasonal, it might be just a time, but there is no shame in needing help and finding it and, you know, getting the help you need to be the better version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, it was other small business owners that really helped me connect with a counselor that worked for me. And Mm -hmm. I do think it's an important tip to really get on the phone, talk to counselors and find one who works with small business owners or creatives. Um, Because Mm -hmm. um, this is so common. Mental health is a real struggle for a lot of people in leadership and running their own small businesses. Um, Counselors who work regularly with small business owners are very attuned to the mindset and um, challenges that we face. Um, There are definitely patterns there and they can just cut through so much crap for you (laughs) when you work with one that is really well attuned to this audience. So it's worth spending a little extra time. Um, if you don't resonate with your your first counselor oh that you meet with, totally okay. They don't take it personally. They want you to find someone um, that you yeah. feel comfortable with. Um, so a little trial and error is part of the process. They are not your hairdresser. You no. won't make them sad. <laughs> no, no, they don't want to get drinks with you on the weekends. They have a job to do and they're yeah. really aware of what that they looks do. like. Um, so you can be pretty honest if someone just, you know, it's not working for you. Try someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So once again, um, that link at the top that Ashley bookmarked in yellow, um, that is a link to a worksheet. If you want to dig into some of the things we've covered today a little bit more, get that strategy in writing so you have it when you need it. Um, That's just a tool for you guys to use. Um, And we're going to get to Q&A here in just a second. Ashley, I think, is running through questions and compiling some things to kick to us. Um, And I just really want to give a shout out before we get to those questions to our sponsors. Um, They're the reason this is free and we can um, compensate all of our speakers who are artists. We think that's really important. Um, So definitely check out some of these sponsors. We were very selective about choosing partners we thought would be valuable resources for you guys. Um, So Google these firms. If they're um, names that aren't familiar to you, um, definitely check them out. They have a lot to offer this audience. Um, And Ashley, come on in. Tell us if there's any questions we should chat a little bit more about. Yeah, so there's definitely a few questions. And if you guys have any more, put them in the chat and I'll get to them as well, hopefully. Um, So one of the things is, do you know of any communities kind of specifically for, you know, those who are just beginning? their jewelry making journey. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Hillary. You probably have a better finger on that than I do. Um, well, I think there are definitely Facebook groups that do this really well. And I know that's a social media platform that not everybody is on, but it definitely has its place. And I think this is one of them. Um, there are a lot of Facebook groups that are really specific to beginning metalsmiths and beginning jewelry artists or yeah. um, small business owners of all stripes. Um, I saw SCORE come Mm -hmm. up in the chat earlier. I'm a huge fan of SCORE and all of their groups Uh, that they offer. Um, So Facebook can be a great place to connect with discussion groups that are really attuned to this audience. Um, I would also recommend um, both Flourish and Thrive and Snag, um, I think are good communities for connecting with with other makers. Um, And they offer Mm -hmm. different ways to connect throughout the year in live sessions or conferences um, or Facebook groups and social media conversations too. So those are a few great resources to help you build community. Lisa, do you have any others that you would chime in with? I mean, I, I'm thinking of beginner stuff. I don't, I don't belong to beginner, you know, not because I'm so amazing, but they, when I was a beginner, there were beginner groups. So I do know there are many groups on Facebook for metalsmiths. And I know even on Instagram, if you put in a hashtag for, you know, jewelry making techniques, you'll, you'll come up with a slew of, of different things. They, you know, there's plenty of things out there. I second recommend Flourish and Thrive. They are very great at fostering community and bringing people together. So um, that's definitely a great place to start. Awesome. And then I'm ne- noticing in the chat, a lot of people are putting in other ones. So if you're looking for some, yes. definitely put that chat. 
Yeah. Uh, Middle so, Cincinnati, yeah. Lucy Walker, those are great tips. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll think of a million after we get off. Right, but right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the beach. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're you there. Um, okay. So, how I had, okay. So, there's kind of a couple I'm going to lump together a little bit. So, there were some people asking, you know, kind of, how you can foster those feelings of satisfaction. And then someone mentioned, how do you overcome imposter syndrome? I feel like those kind of do go together a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna kind of talk about how do you just kind of probably feel better about yourself and feel like you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would say for me, I think one of the, the things I see a lot in the jewelry community is there are a lot of people doing um, a lot of the same thing that's just natural. I mean, you, we are all going to at some point make something that looks like somebody else's or do whatever else. I think what's very important is to find your own design style. And, you know, yes, we're going to be influenced by something we see over here, or this person's here, but find your own design style. I think when you, for me, I start with a pen. Every design starts with a pen. So for me, I feel like I have more ownership to my design. So therefore, when I complete a design, I don't feel much of that imposter syndrome. I feel like that is me. That is part of me. So I feel like really finding that style of your own, I don't know if that answers the question completely, but it just, you know, finding a place where you can not do the comparison game to everybody else, but look at your own piece and your own work and then stand on that and feel accomplished with what you do. You know, whatever technique you've learned, there's so much out there and you know so many techniques to master i'm i'm hardly an expert so that's just for me if that yeah helps. and i would just kind of circle back to that celebrating wins and just recognizing progress i think it's really important when you're self-employed to have a checkpoint for yourself and january is a great time to do it it's one of the reasons we have the conference now it's really good during a slow time of year to set aside a week or so to just do a little bit of planning do a little mini self-performance review. And um, I say that not to prompt you to be critical of yourself, but to recognize what you've accomplished in the year behind you. Mm -hmm. um, because without stopping and thoughtfully um, forcing that checkpoint for yourself, um, again, we just naturally as entrepreneurs get caught up in all the things we're not doing and we forget what we have done. We forget what we accomplished in the year behind us. Uh, we forget to take a moment and pat ourselves on the back and celebrate that and say, you know what? I accomplished a lot this year. I grew my business, or maybe I didn't this year, but I learned this. And I also identified this yeah. gap and I'm gonna address it and I'm gonna tackle that and overcome it. Um, so definitely have a little bit of a checkpoint like that um, where you look behind you as well as ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Stop being so, so hard on yourself. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so there was the, kind of a discussion and I was wondering if you maybe could address it a little bit. So Shannon Russell pointed out that Etsy has an expected 24 hour turnaround message response time. So with that, you know, sometimes that may hit that boundary of like she pointed out a holiday weekend and someone else pointed out that they do have auto response, but that stress of if I don't, if I break this boundary and respond or I don't break it, but now I my Etsy rating may go down or something. Can you kind of address like when it's that double-edged sword of stress? I have a lot of opinions on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, Etsy is an entity of itself. Etsy has done great things. They are their own self. If you choose to sell on Etsy, that's part of, of what you have. Um, they don't you do not have to respond in 24 hours, but they do have a star seller kind of rating. I just don't care. <laughs> I mean, I, I live in my own boundaries and whatever. And I've been on Etsy since the beginning. So I just, you know, I, it's, it is hard, especially if you're new, because I know those rules seem really important. But you still, even in that 24 hours, you could find a space, um, you know, where you could have a response time. Or, you know, you could put your shop on vacation mode and then you have no expectations. So yeah. that's completely up to you. Yeah, and I think autoresponders are a really important tool. Um, you know, they really do serve a purpose, especially for those of us who are self-employed. Like there is a time and a place for that and it's totally okay to have an autoresponder that says, 
um, you know, thank you. Your message has been received. I will get back to you within three business days because my lead times are a little bit longer right now. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, I don't know Etsy's policies specifically, but I, I do think you have to kind of take control of some of those things if they're making you nuts. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. for sure. Um, so someone just wanted to clarify what you meant by batch working. So batch working is really when you choose to do, um, you batch your whatever it is you're working on that day in different pieces. So computer time, um, accounting time. Um, for me in the studio, it's de design time, um, making bezels. Like I put things into very specific groups and set a time frame on that. And so that way I know that in that time frame, I'm only doing that task and not stepping outside, you know, not, and then that just keeps me, you know, a little bit more on a schedule, if that helps. Awesome. And then I'll just do one last one. How can, what are some ways you can think of to help find just other local makers? We've talked about the digital spaces, but how about just local in your town area? Mm -hmm. For me, I mean, I, I am blessed to live in an area that has a lot of amazing jewelry artists. Um, and so some of them I knew before I moved to the area that I'm in. And sometimes people will, re new people will reach out to me in that area. So I think, um, I mean, that I, I don't belong to any groups in my local area. I just have been so blessed to be around such amazing jewelry artists in my own region. But I mean, you can find them. You can do that on Etsy. You can search for people by area and find other. I mean, that's how I found different artists just to buy things from, um, not necessarily jewelry. So that's a great way to find other local people. But um, yeah, I don't have a specific way of doing that. Yeah, I think both Facebook um, and LinkedIn, and you mentioned Etsy, they do have locations that you can search. Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely done that to kind of find other nearby small business owners for different reasons. Um, but then it is kind of on you to kind of reach out and try and connect with those folks and see if they want to go to coffee or have a Zoom call or, or some other way to connect. Yeah. Um, but it, it does require a little bit of initiative, but you can definitely do it. Okay. Awesome. So I hope you guys all enjoyed this session with Lisa and Hillary. Um, we're going to go ahead and end it here. Be sure to join us in our social hour coming up in about 20 ish minutes or so. Um, we're going to do a giveaway from accounting for jewelers. Uh, Halstead has a few, a couple giveaways for you guys and kind of just get prepped and ready for tomorrow. So I hope to see you all there in 20 minutes or so and hope you enjoy the rest of the week as well. Thank you so much for coming guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Lisa. Have a great vacation. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Bye. Bye.